Greetings to all our listeners. This is a special edition of Books in the World because it happens to be National Poetry Month, and we happen to have as our guest David Surrett, a distinguished local poet. So David, um, this, I don't know how it happened, but here we have you here, and uh, we're going to talk um, about his general work, but also his most recent book, Stables, which, uh, Stable rather, which I found quite delightful. But I have to ask you, when you tell people you're a poet, what's the reaction that you get? Um, it, well, it matters who they are, I guess. Sometimes they, they act like it's uh, something from another time, something, you know, surprised that anyone's a poet, and sometimes they, uh, they just look, at the, look in the different direction. They go, oh, like it's nothing. <laughs> and other times it's, it, the reaction is that, you know, maybe I know something, that I have a secret, that, you know, that it's a secret thing to be. Well, you know, I, I was reading some of the reviews that David has had, and they're really astounding. Now, I have to tell you, he's also a teacher, a high school teacher. Yes. And so, I, I, but I have to ask you, what, how do kids react to poetry these days? I think they, they, they react just the way everybody reacts, is that you have, to, you have to sort of break a barrier. They think it's something that's just difficult. So I, I make them, I start every class with a poem. And, and then over the course of the year, I try to demystify what a poem is and show them how a poem works. And, and uh, you'd be surprised that when I, if I skip a day without a poem, they get aggravated. They say, no, 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 we have to do the poem first. So it's just, it's just, it's sort of like books that you know, kids don't want to read. It's, there's a book for everybody, there's a poet for everybody, there's poems for everybody. I just, they just need to get lots of them. You know, I, um, I was wondering, does rap music, because rap music has a, an element of poetry to it, so could that be a linkage for kids about poetry? Oh, absolutely, and certainly in urban schools. And, and I teach in East Bridgewater, so not so much. But as far as when you go do like um, Mass Poetry Society, uh, uh, Festival has a day of student poems, and there's lots of that uh, influence in there. So absolutely, um, it's, it's added to it. So yes. Now, David and I were talking before uh, this started about you know, the image of poets over the centuries has been sort of rakish image of, you know, Lord Byron or Dylan Thomas or, you know, people like that. And he tells me he is not like that. No, I, no, I, I, I would think I'm, I hope I'm more Jack Kerouac's, you know, French-Canadian guy from Massachusetts. That's, but he had his moments on he, the road. Well, you know, I had, I'm sure I had my moments. That, yeah, that he's, but he was sort of, a, he was an athlete, he was a football player, he was you know, working class guy, he's, he's sort of, he's one of those people I look at and say, oh, okay, I can be invited to that party with, uh, with the other writers. You know what, I saw um, one of the reviewers said that your, your work was akin to Walt Whitman's in that you took, which is heady praise indeed, yeah. <laughs> um, which is that you could take a common element that we all identify with and make that meaningful in poetry. How do you react to that? Well, it's, yeah, it's nice to be said in the same sentence, but yes, and yes. I think that's what Whitman was great, that, and what made him so American was that he celebrated just everybody and everything. Well, if you were a carpenter, there was poetry. There was poetry everywhere to him. So yes, he's. Uh, it's. I think the two big ones you, you think you know Whitman and Dickinson, and so if I'm if if I get mentioned with either one of them, uh, that's great. But yeah, I, I can see that. Now, when I read this book, but I had one of your others too, I wondered. Um, you reminded me a little of Robert Frost, too, or is that not an apt comparison? Um, no, I, what I think might be similar is when you read him out loud, you can't help but read him in, in a New England accent, in a very conversational accent, and I think that's how his rhymes disappear, and, and I think the same way, because that's the final test of, of when I think a poem is done, when I read it out loud and it sounds exactly like me, and I have a... I have a, an accent, I have an exact voice, I have the same accent, my Malden accent that I grew up with. So I, I, think, I think I can hear, I think we sound the same sometimes. You know, I, I saw an interview with you, see, everything lives on the, on the internet, yeah. so you cannot escape anything you may have said. And I probably didn't see said. it because I wouldn't have watched it. Yeah, well, no, I, I, I didn't watch it, but I did read it, in which you uh, said that you had started out writing novels, is that right? Yes. And what happened? Um, I, I, I don't know, they just ended up in drawers, and I think what happened was, was was life. I, I had three kids by the time I was 30. I was working full time. Um, I ended up with all these animals. So I, yeah, I think it's really, really time. Um, they're there. They're still in drawers and places. And I, and, and I hope to go back to it. But 
I don't know, something about the making that poem, that little thing just made sense to me, and it made sense to other people. So the combination of those two things, I just stuck with it. And what, what kind of novels were you interested in writing? Um, well, I, I think, well, I, I can just tell you, one was about a, a rock and roll guy, because I, I, for about five years I managed a punk rock band. So, and then uh, the other one was about growing up in a place like Malden. So yeah, I guess, you know, just working class guys getting in trouble. <laughs> Well, you know what, I also found out in doing my detective work that you were the lyricist for your brother's band. Yes, yes. How did uh, that work out? Well, what it was is he was probably, the band were 16, 17, 18 years old, and uh, he wrote music really quickly, but he, he couldn't keep up lyrically. So I used to just write the lyrics, and I'd leave him in his guitar case. We never talked about him. He never, you know, thanked me. Or we, <laughs> and then the next week he'd be on stage and I, I would hear the song and there, there were my words in his mouth. It was, it was great. It was very exciting. Because don't you think there is, there is a similarity in lyrics, song lyrics, and the kind of things we see in poetry as well, right? Yeah, yeah I didn't grow up reading tons of poetry, but I loved words and music, you know, so I loved the Beatles and the Kinks and the Stones and those, they're great lyricists, they're great writers. So I think that's what I, that's what I heard first. And I still, I still love great lyricists. Um, you know, I, I love Springsteen, I always love Dylan and uh, Elvis Costello, so that's where I started. And then, I, with, then when I started to read poetry, I saw the connection. And now I know, I think, the difference, which is really good. Cause and what is the difference? The, well, the difference, you can't depend on, on, on the beat, you can't depend on the melody, um, you can't depend on so many things, so you have to, you have to be more inventive um, with the actual words and the rhythm of the words and the, um, and the sound of the words. So I think they're different. I think the poem's a little more naked. Because I'll hear a song that I've known since I was five years old, and I'll say, oh, that's what it's about. Because <laughs> the music is so great, um, I think poems have to be a little more, um, I don't know, naked and alone. My goodness, you do have those instincts in you then, you see? Now, um, tell me this, who is, what poet what poet from, let's say, 19th century poet do you admire, and then what contemporary poet do you admire? Oh, okay. I, I'm trying to think. Um, the do in the times. The oh, poet. 20th. The, well, no, the poet that first connected me with was Yeats. I loved Yeats. And, and maybe part of that reason is that when I was in college, that's where I met my wife, um, I read Yeats to her. And just the sound of, of his poetry still amazes me. So I would say that he's my, my you know, long gone poet. My modern poet, um, we just lost a whole bunch of poets I really loved. We just lost Thomas Lux and Jack McCarthy was really important to me and Bridget Kelly. Um, those are sort of the three poets that I really, um, really read. So today, I don't know, um, um, I'm trying to think who I really like right now. Um, George Bilgier is really good. He's really funny and really down to earth. Um, I like Billy Collins. Um, Mary Oliver on the Cape, I certainly, but now that I'm on the Cape, Mary Oliver, I, I, I'm gonna read and reread because um, she's the Cape poet. She's, I'm gonna be looking at what she looks at and maybe and, and I can be inspired. Seeing it with different eyes though, right? Yes. Y you know, um, I, I, and you're going to ask that, and the second you ask that, all the names of my oh, favorite I know. poets. Fell well, I was hoping, for, I was hoping for that to see, you know, what your reaction. You know what? Now, in your book, Stable, of course, I'm a big time animal lover. So I think, do you think that this volume of poetry might have connected more with people, even than some of your other ones? Well, well, that's sort of the the story behind it. Um, I just mentioned Bridget Kelly, who who was my teacher at Breadloaf, and. She always said, David, I, I like your poems, but I love your animal poems best. So I had already four books out, and, and in the books, there were probably always like five to 10 animal poems. So I got those all together, sort of inspired by her, but also I wanted to impress her and show her <laughs> what it looked like when they were all together. So I, so I think it's the book that has a theme. All the other books um, were maybe 50 poems, and the poems moved through time, but. Um, from when I was a little kid to the present, but this is just um, just animals, and yeah, people do react quickly to it. Yeah, so I, I, it was a good idea by me. <laughs> it, well, hey, um, <laughs> to put there, them together. There was a discussion about um, in one of the things I saw about anthropomorphism, and is it you know is that a good idea or not? But I I thought you did a I, I loved 
your, your use of them, particularly about your dogs? Yeah, what's interesting about the animals is that I've never bought an animal or brought an animal home. It's never been my idea. It's always been, um, well, I used to say I couldn't go away because if I went away for a weekend, my <laughs> wife and daughter brought home a horse or, or, or a goat. Or a, so um, I sort of come at them sideways that I, that, that I didn't make the deal, but I always was the one that um, had to deal with them. That when, well, the horses are a good example. As my wife told me one day, uh, we just moved into this new house. We had like four acres of woods, forests, and she said, my, my aunt's sending a racehorse down in four weeks. Can I have a patio, or can I have a paddock and a, and a stable? And I had never built anything. I said, okay, mm -hmm. so I did. So, so much, as I had to approach animals um, so much as not my idea that they kept teaching me things over and over again and, and kept surprising me. And that's what I hope the poems do, is that the poems um, have that surprise in them, is that when you, they just surprise you all the time. They, they show you things about yourself you didn't know you had in you. Well, for our listeners' sake, what, what did you particularly find from, from animals that what lessons did you learn from them? And how are they illustrated in your, in your work? Um, one is, is patience, and the other is meeting them on their own terms. And the third is that, um, that violence never works with them. And I think those are the three things, is that you wait for them, um, and, and you meet them, especially horses, since it's prey and predator, is that you you teach them your language and they teach you their language and you can meet them halfway and then they're they're so cooperative and so loving and then finally yeah that you that there's no room for for violence or meanness now uh, do you ever take those lessons as a teacher and apply them oh, to your students yeah yes kids are teenagers are horses <laughs> they, they'd rather be with themselves each other um, secondly that they, they they don't like anything new and their favorite thing, one of their favorite things is to eat. So I'm like six down the list. So I, always, I have to always be aware that they're looking at the world so differently than I am and sort of find that in-between space. And again, yelling, yelling at them and being mean to them doesn't help, it doesn't work. So yes, it changed, changed me as a teacher of the horses, they are, absolutely. Now, you know, it, it seems to me that being a teacher is one of, being a good teacher is one of the most difficult jobs you can have. There's some people, I mean, you can phone in any job, right, and, and just show up, but to be a good teacher who connects with your students? Well, it, yeah, it just, it's, it sounds silly, but it's so people intensive, you're always negotiating. You know, sometimes, well, what, my classes are 30 kids sometimes, so that's 30 kids, 17 and 18 year olds, and I have to negotiate with all of them and try to find that place that um, I can teach them something that I think is important or, or, and convince them there it's important. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't know about how hard things are, how difficult, I don't know. I'd rather, I wouldn't want to be a coal miner. That seems really well, hard. Yeah, that, yeah, that, <laughs> but you know, I, I student taught myself for one year, it was not a great year, and I had 48 seventh graders in the last period of the day, all of them boys, and it was, it was yeah. horrific. So I understand what you mean about it's negotiating. <laughs> it was a little frightening, I got to yes. tell you. But you know, I, I understand <clears throat> what you mean about negotiating, and, and also, have you gotten them to write poetry as well? Oh, yeah, we, they all write poetry. All my kids have to write poetry, yes. Uh, is that a big struggle? Um, I, I, th I think as a teacher, what, what I do is I trick them into doing things that they don't think, the pressure isn't we're gonna write poetry. Um, I've, I've created lessons in that, they think they're doing, they're just writing and that they're just expressing themselves and at the end they, they have poems and they're surprised by it. I do the same thing with fiction, is that the way I teach fiction is that, you know, after a certain amount of days I say, now put this together and look what you have and it's like, it's a poem, it's a story. Now, well, do you find sharing your work in public forums difficult? For me? No. No, I think that's, the, that's one of the best part of it. I, I, I always threaten that don't invite me to read because I'll come read. <laughs> yeah, I, there's, I'm at a point that writing doesn't mean much to me if there's not an audience. So I, I want people to read the poems and the best way to get them to read the poems is to, is to read them to them. And, and I know sometimes a good audience can help you in terms of Oh, absolutely. Reaction. Yeah, I, 
when I used to do a lot of open mics, as I sat there waiting for my turn, I would, my poems would change 10 times because I knew that it wasn't good enough to be read to them yet. So I was, I was changing things and erasing things. So that kind of pressure absolutely helps them. Plus, you know, I want it to be my voice and I can tell when it's not true. I can tell when, the way they react, the way they look at me, that it's not true. That, How would you describe your voice as a poet? Oh, I don't know. I, I'm, I think it's, I think it's where I grew up. I, I, I've been accused of having a working class accent. Um, so I have that. Um, my father was uh, French Canadian, Acadian French. So I think there's that. My mother is um, of Irish descent. I think there's a little lilt in there. So I, I, I think all those things are there. And I think my education is there. Uh, and I just, I just listen to it. <laughs> And when I write, if, if it sounds like me, whenever I do like a reading in between, you might do a little talking and people have said, sometimes you don't know when the poem starts. And I think that's good. I think that's, I want to be, I want the poems to be conversational and then more. Now, I also saw you had a reaction when people say, how do you deal with critics? Tell, tell us, because, you know, we all as writers, poets or whatever, um, the Internet allows people to be critics and we all have to face it. How do you deal with criticism? Uh, yeah, I, 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 would, I can't read it. I, I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I'm, I really don't even, even look at it. And if I, because if I read a review of a book and there are 20 nice things and there's one bad thing, yeah, maybe that's, maybe that's part of the chip in my shoulder, working class thing is, yeah, no, I don't take criticism very well. <laughs> very well. And I just, if you're not, if you don't like it, then there's lots of other poets. Go to somebody, go read somebody else. Yeah, I, I don't, <laughs> I don't read reviews either for the no. same reason, because I think it's easy to focus on the negative and not, not yeah, the yes. constructive part yes. of it. Yes, yeah. yeah. Now, do you uh, belong to a poet's group where other poets, where you share your work with other poets and they critique it? I haven't for a long time. I, I used to run a uh, poetry series called Poet Tribe for five or six years. And that, so I was with a group of poets and, and there were, some of the people were in, you know, getting their MFAs and other people were um, more hobbyists and other people were really, just all different levels. So yes, I used to, but not anymore. No, I, I, it's pretty solitary right now. I, I, um, I think, yeah, not anymore. <laughs> and I don't think, I, I don't feel like I need it right now, but I do need an audience. I do need to go out and read. If I'm not out reading, I, I'm not writing. For anyone in the audience who is a poet or aspires to be a poet, what would be the value of having, belonging to a poetry group? Oh, no, it was great because um, people, know, people know things that you don't know. So it's great to hear someone say, you know, um, your line breaks. What if you tried this? And I'm going, oh, that's right. I haven't thought that much about line breaks. And all of a sudden you're thinking about line breaks. And there's a lot, you know, there's lots of better writers and poets out there than me. So... Um, you can learn something, and you just and you learn the, the, the dynamics of a group too. You know the person who um, wants to tell you what they know, and you know the person who's always negative, and you know the person who's always positive. And you just find the the people that are, that um, first of all they like they have to like what you're writing, at least enough to want to help you with it. Those are the people that I listen to. And you know. Um this is what your fourth volume or fifth volume of fifth. Oh, okay. What can you tell the audience a little bit about your others' works? Um, well, the, well, they're all pretty much the same, and I do them chronologically. Um, I usually do if, uh, in thirds. The first third is usually growing up Malden poems, you know, about my neighbors and about my uh, my friends and my family. Um, and the middle ones are the animal poems because those are the that's my second uh, part of my life. And the end is always uh, my grown-up family poems and friends poems. So they all move kind of chronologically like that. And I think the next book that I'm going to do, I think I'm going to do another uh, like stable. I'm going to put together all the Malden poems, the growing up poems from birth to like 18 years old. And I've written some new ones too, just so then I'm sort of, with, I'm sort of done with the animal poems and I'll be done with sort of the Malden growing up gritty poems. <laughs> do you ever have people complain that they think you're talking about them in your poems? They only complain if I don't write about them. <laughs> but I, but I, I did a reading once in Malden, maybe two years ago, and uh, uh, at the end it's a library reading and there were questions and a woman stood up and she said that uh, um, I saw that you, that you were advertised in the newspaper and I came to hear you read and, and I read a poem called uh, The Diabetic about a, the kid who sat next to me in third grade who was a diabetic 
And she said, I particularly like the John Conley poem. And I said, really? She said, yeah, it's my son. And this was like 30 years that, from that moment. And I, had, I was like, I had that moment of panic. Does that mean you're mad I wrote about your son? But it was actually a really nice moment. So, no, people usually, because I, I, I'm not telling their story. I'm usually telling how they affected me. And um, so they're not, there's not like, I don't have any revenge poems. Oh, you don't? No. Now that's disappointing. No. <laughs> You've never tried. You never tried no, to write I, a score in any of your poems. No, I, no, I, 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 no. I think I'm aiming for moments of, um, you know, about. I think they're all about moments that you that you loved or that you loved somebody. I'm not. Yeah, I, I, there's nothing. I try to keep the meanness out of it. So you're not a poet of anger, then? No, not at all. No, no there's no. No, that, then yeah. When I guess when I was a punk rock lyricist, I, I <laughs> get that, that out of my system, system. <laughs> but no, it's no, no, no anger. Now, what, what is the message that you like readers to take away from your work? Um, I, that I, I think, I hope the poems all say, here's some really hard things, but you're okay. <laughs> that there are moments that are okay. I think that's what a poem does, is that it shows you that, you know, sometimes that that life doesn't make sense because two things are true at the same time and they're not, they're, they're, they're in conflict. And um, the way out of it is to wonder and to dream and to hope and to love and to care that if you have those, that, if you can find that moment, you'll be okay most of the time. Well, that's, that's therapeutic then. Can you share um, some of the poems that, can you share one of your poems with, um, with us? Sure, sure. Give uh, people a flavor for the... Uh, Sure. For the message that you're giving us. Okay, I'll finish. I usually finish my reading with, with this one, and um, it's called the <clears throat> it's called the holder. Um, my neighbor calls because it's time to share the alpacas, and we own one and a half from her herd. She likes me to hold them. It's a new share of this year, a different woman, but it's the same. She wants to be. She wants me to be firmer and threatens the animals with worse if they can't behave. She mocks how I talk to alpacas. The horse trainer we hired for my daughter's horse did the same, but I'm good at this. It's all tension and release. Fir firm, then give, then reward in my hands and in my voice. With the kicker of the herd, I hold his leg up. Firm but soft, he is sheared before he can land a blow. I don't know why these women want a different kind of man. Most days I find it funny, but today it aggravates me. Even the thank yous from the sharer and my neighbor doesn't help. I'm old and tired and having to prove to them that the open hand is as strong as the fist. Oh, very nice. Very nice. Now, just as a matter of thing, alpacas can be a Alpac problem? Yes. They're, yes. They're, and I, I haven't made friends with one yet. They're, they're pretty... <laughs> And, and, and when you share them, a, a sheep, you flip upside down, they just relax and you share them. You have to, um, they, the alpaca doesn't like to be shared. Often they tie them down, like just tie them, like four quarters them, and then share them. But uh, I think I can hold one and keep one calm. But yeah, it's, they, they can spit and kick, man, they can be fresh. Not unlike some of the humans that we encounter, <laughs> right? Yes, and it, yes. And, you have, and it's that whole idea of the, you have to be strong and firm, but you also um, have to fool them with, with kindness. You know, you, you told me that you have recently moved to the Cape from Easton, so you had, you know, you're in a, a smaller area um, yes, to live I in. Yes, I traded the animals for, well, I still have the dogs, but for, for the beach. So, and, and it's sort of, it's, it's, yeah, no more horses, no more sheep, no more alpacas, just, just the dogs and it's, I, I miss I do miss the horses, but not enough to to um, want to go fix fences and shovel manure every day. <laughs> yeah, well, I suppose that the charm of that could wear off pretty easily. Now, you know, what do you see as a as a poet? Do you see that your work relative to the Cape will be different than what you had done previously? Um, I don't know yet because I I don't think I think that's one of the reasons I want to do I did this book and I want to do the Malden poem sort of let that kind of poetry go and see what the Cape gives me. Um, I've never been a nature poet. I've always been a people and animal poet. So I'll, I'll, we'll see. I'm not I'm not sure yet because I haven't written really 
uh, maybe this summer. I haven't written, because all my Cape poems for being young were all, um, um, I don't know, kissing girls on the beach poems. Oh. <laughs> oh, well, I was a kid. Well, that, yeah, that, that, might, that might change. And that doesn't bit. happen anymore. <laughs> Thank goodness. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I guess in, in closing, what I'd, what I'd like to say is that your work has a universality to it that I think speaks to people of all kinds. Thank and, you. and that's why uh, you have these glowing reviews and your comparisons to, uh, to the, some of the great American poets. And that is something to be able to speak to people of all types in language that they can understand that's meaningful for them. That's really a difficult thing to do. Yeah, I always say I'm the poet of the husband that was dragged to the poetry reading or the friend who was dragged that they always say, oh, okay, this isn't so bad. It's not so bad. Yes. <laughs> so that means a lot to me. I like that connection. And, you know, we, we talked a little bit in closing. I'll say, you know, we talked about how kids have to learn about Shakespeare before they can get over the hurdle of, of that. And, and seemingly poetry is the same thing. I think so. I, I think, yeah, I don't know why there's a fear of it. Maybe it was the moderns who made it all so difficult, but I don't know. I'm well, doing the best I can. <laughs> well, your, your best is pretty good. And thank I you. wanted to thank our guest today, uh, David Surrett. Once again, Stable is the uh, volume that we talked about today, but he's got a couple of others too. And I think that you will enjoy reading and parsing his work because it really does have a, a theme that applies to everyone. David, thanks so much. I enjoyed oh, talking you. to you. Nice thank talking you very to much. You.